Okay, let's go ahead and start it with our afternoon session. So in this session, what we'll be doing is a hands-on example on one-dimensional river model. So I'll first go over um, what we'll be doing. Uh, I'll show you the steps, what we, we're going to do, and then at the end, we'll go on developing the model together. So the main objective of this session is to make you guys familiar with EE, graphical user interface. We'll create a simple grid using um, E of PC Explorer's inbuilt grid building function. Then we'll create time series for boundary conditions and then assign initial conditions, bottom elevation and water surface elevations. Then we'll view the uh, model results and show you some of the visualization features that you can use in your model. Then running the model, some and we'll do some calibration um, hands-on, and at the end we'll start working on the model. So the problem here is derived from Th Thoman and Mueller principles of surface water quality modeling and control. It's a steady state problem, so you have uh, an analytical solution as well. So I'm not going to go over these uh, equations, but so the river or the study area that we are going to look at is a very simple structure, simple river segment. So the length of 60,000 meters. So the numbers here are calculated based on the description given, uh, given here, but for our for our study, we don't need uh, how it came, but we just we are interested in what is the actual length of the river segment, and what is the incoming flow from the upstream, and how much flow is leaving on the downstream. So here are three, four boundaries. One is flow coming in from the upstream is 2.83 cms, and flow from the east branch is zero. Uh, the objective is just to show you how to add different uh, different boundaries. Um, it doesn't matter if it's zero or uh, whatever number. And on the left, you have a wastewater treatment plant coming into the system. And then at the downstream, you have a downstream boundary. It can be either flow boundary or it can be water surface elevation boundary. So we are going to use water surface elevation boundary on the downstream. So since the flow is coming uh, from the upstream at continuously at 2.83 CMS, the flow will continually go out, out of the domain from the downstream. But if you want to use the flow, it will be the summation of whatever flow is coming into the upstream. It would be upstream plus wash water treatment plant. That would be the sum. It's 3.16 CMS. So these were the numbers calculated based on the example again, the, those equations I showed you before but we don't need to understand these for the example. So the, uh, for the input data, in order to have your bottom elevation and roughness, it's especially trial and error and based on the literature values. So for the steady state uh, problem, you, are, you need to adjust the bottom elevation so that you, you go to the steady state condition. So um, on this example, we're going to use bottom roughness of 0 0.06 meter, but um, bottom roughness doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Just to make sure we're on the same page, we're going to use this number. Channel slope we're going to use is 0 0.00005. The only reason we're going to use that channel really is um, this slope is because we want to reach the steady state as fast as possible. So I will show you how to specify these um, using EFTC Explorer. And in EFTC model, cell depths are computed from the channel slope and upstream and downstream bottom elevations. That's all known. And then we will also introduce um, dye in this example. So we want to see what are the concentration of water coming from wastewater treatment plant and so we will tie dye concentration to upstream to the wastewater treatment plant and also to the east branch, though it doesn't have any uh, values to it. So this is that. Um, over here, it's showing the 
volume weighted concentration how it's ca being calculated to from wastewater treatment plant to downstream boundary so i will have a table later so we can re refer to that table and see what numbers we need to plug in in our model so hands on start so first what we are going to do is create a new model click on uh, generate new model button on the top and then it will give us uh, this um, form where we will specify what is the grid size that we are going to use for example and I'll go over several options later then after you specify what is your you know um, DX and DUI for example here DX is 30 DUI is 1550 then you hit update on the top and then it will create a grid for you so using these settings it will create 40 grids and, and sure no, not not yet. So I'll, I'll we'll work together. So just want to give you overview of what we will be doing each step. So we create the grid. Then we will go to view plan to see how it, how our grid looks like. Uh, right now it looks like straight line because our DX is way too small compared to DUI. So in order to view it uh, clearly, we're going to increase the scale in each direction change to 100 so we can view each cell as a different cell so when you do that you'll see cells like this and in EFDC model each cell has I and J index that's how EFDC keeps track of which cell is which and based on I and J index they are also represented by L index that's a single index for example if you have a uh, 100 cells your number of l will be 100 plus 2 is 102 so that's how the eftc works i think i have another slide to show you how what are the structure um but you don't need to understand everything right now so here what you need to understand is the cell on the most top here it has an i index of 3 and the j index of 42 so if you're looking at um, I of 3 and J of 42, it would refer to this cell. And then bottom elevation, we haven't assigned it, but it will look like this. I think I have another slide to show how the bottom elevation was assigned. And if you want to see all I and J index on each cell, you can go to cell indices, the reviewing option, and you can see I and J. If you want to see the L index, yeah, there, there is an option to show L index and if you want to show only the southern components or eastern components we'll come back to it later and see it after we have created the grid now it's time to assign the initial and initial conditions so for bathymetry um, our surface elevation and bottom roughness will assign from domain tab on the left and then it has four sub tabs we'll go to initial and bottom conditions and then we'll assign initial and bottom bottom elevations. So for bottom elevation, when you click on assign button right there, it will pop up this um, window. And here, since we are we have one directional component, it's only on J direction. So we're going to select J. And this is the slope that I said earlier we are going to use. So we have assigned slope of negative 0.5 times e to the power four. And then after you are satisfied to the condition, whatever you are specifying to your model, then you hit apply. If you have X, Y, and Z values for those cells, you can specify from browse where it says data file. Then you can browse to your um, text file or that file, and then it will assign uh, bottom elevations to the corresponding cells. Um, now, what surface elevation? In this example, we're going to assign a depth of one meter on all the cells. So there are two options to assign initial condition. One is to use the depth, or another one is to just, use, if you don't check depth, then it will assign what surface elevation of one to all the cells. So what that does is now the difference between water surface elevation and bottom elevation is your depth for the particular cell come over again so as you will notice the form regardless of which option you choose the all the options are similar um, setting initial conditions for um, bottom elevation and water surface elevation 
there are slight differences, but overall the structure looks the same. So in order to apply that particular values to your model, you need to make sure you hit apply. If you just click done, it doesn't do anything. After you hit apply and then it will do its job and, add it, and then it returns with this modified footage cell. And this number will change depending on how many cells you have in your model. Now that we have created grid and assigned word surface elevation and bottom elevation, we'll save our model. Um, we'll save to one folder. After we have saved our model, we can view how our word surface elevation profile and bottom elevation profile would look like. And then there are several ways to do that. You specify your I or J index, or you can specify a polygon, a polyline. So this example we have, I is not changing on each cell. It ranges from three, but the J index is changing. So we're uh, viewing from I index of three. So it would look like this. The um, brown is your bottom elevation and the blue is your sur word surface elevation. Since we assigned one, so it's parallel to bottom elevation. If you, if you want to look how your grid looks like, it will look like this. Since each grid has different bottom elevation and one meter depth, so it looks like a step. Now that we can look at our bottom elevation again, and these are the locations where we will specify our upstream and downstream. So in order to specify upstream and downstream, we, ha we are going to import um, some labels into the into the background so we know exactly at what points we want to um, introduce the boundary conditions. So if you go to, if you click on bottom elevations, then it will show you places where you can add annotations. I'll, dis I'll discuss more when we're doing hands-on. Then we are going to import um, locations where the boundary conditions are as well as locations where we have the um, measured data or the analytical solution. So after you do that, these are the locations where you will assign the boundary conditions. You can change the symbols as you wish. Next we'll do is import the data stations and these are the locations where we have the data available in order to compare the results. So if you look everything together, it will look like this. The blue ones are our boundary conditions and the black ones are our um, monitoring stations. Then we'll assign boundary condition to our to our uh, boundaries. We'll, so this is the table that we will use when we are assigning boundary condition. Upstream we have 2.832 CMS. So on East Branch 0, wastewater treatment plant 0.3. Downstream if you, if you were to use a flow boundary the flow going out of the system will have negative sign. So it will be minus 3.161 if you want to use a flow, uh, but we'll just use water surface elevation. Regardless of this or water surface elevation, you choose your answer will still be same for this example. Then to, we assign flow to different series. After we assign flow, we'll activate the dye module in EFDC and then assign the dye concentration to each um, boundary groups. Then after we have imported all the data, now it's time to actually assign which cell is upstream, which cell is downstream, which water treatment plan, etc. And we'll show you how to link all of those cell information and the data together in a flow boundary condition properties group window and we'll assign those flows and dye concentrations. I'll show you how to assign the boundary condition. So you'll notice the, f um, the form for open boundary and for the flow boundary will be different. So after you have assigned a uh, boundary condition, uh, this um, checkbox with a bigger X in the middle are the flow boundaries and on the bottom there is a S that that means the flow is uh, um, open boundary on the south direction. 
and after you have specified your boundary condition, initial condition, now you have to specify how long you have to run your model. So we are going to run our model from 200 to uh, 220 days. So specify reference periods. I'll explain more when we are going over it, going over in hands on. Then you have to specify how long, how frequent you are going to output your output your results. So we are going to output our results every 15 minutes. There are options if you want to um, specify your output for any particular period. If you want high frequency, then you can go here and change. Again, we'll explore it. Um, let's see. Here, um, this is where you set your weighting and drying parameters. If you want to use weighting and drying, you click here use that means you, it will use weighting and drying and then you have to specify dry depth and wet depth after you have provided all the parameters and all the timing information now it's time to save your model it's time to it's ready to run the model then when you are ready you you first make sure you're using, using the latest or right executable so in order to do that, there is a setting like button on the top. If you click that, it will pop up EFDC Explorer settings. And then um, we are going to run EFDC plus model and then browse and point to the appropriate executable. So if you were, if you have uh, executable for EFDC ZBC or EPA version, you specify over here on the browse, the second, second field. And if you want to specify what software you want to use when you're editing your uh, input files outside of EFDC, you, you can choose um, um, Notepad Plus or WordPad, whatever you want to use. By default, I think it would it would take Notepad. So here on the bottom, there are several restart options. So yeah, for, for some reason, you want to use a restart file or you want to run a model for let's say five days and after six days you want to use the starting point at the end of five days, then you have option to use the restart. There is one cold start, restart. Uh, we'll go over this later as we do hands on. Now after you are ready to run the model, you go on the top where it says EFDC and, and there is a play sign. You click on that button and then it will prompt this window right here where it says general model, where it has three options, general, model timing, and runtime diagnostics. So we'll explore all of these options as we go along, but for now we'll just focus on the number that we need to insert here. So the number max here would be different depending on your uh, computer configuration. So this max means I have maximum of eight threads. Um, but it's best to use a half of the threads because that will give you the maximum performance. And if you want to use two instances of model runs, then you, you want to use two number of OMP threads here and then two on the another one so that your threads wouldn't collide or the computer doesn't get confused which thread is using being used on which model. Again, we'll discuss more later. Um, so this is a typical um, executable screen that you will see when you are running a, your EFTC model. And on the, there is a column here what, which says what are the values on each columns. It's time in days, time, time step. And these are the output for one particular cell where you specify your I and J. So you can change that uh, runtime I and J in EFTC Explorer to see what changes are being occurred on that particular cell. I'll show you how to change that cell. And all of those results correspond to that particular cell here. Then we'll view results. We'll select time series, water by layer, extract concentration, then we'll look at profile. We have data for profile, we'll import data, we'll compare. The, uh, these are analytical solution, and uh, the dotted blue and the red one is the model results. 
And after we are done with the first set, then we'll add a conservative pressure in our model. That means the dye will decay. Um, so this is a typical um, graph where your S0 is your initial condition and K is your decay rate. And your concentration will be updated based on this equation. So we have our analytical solution based on this equation and we'll use our model run results to compare uh, analytical solution and the model run. So in order to specify a uh, dye growth or um, a dye decay or growth rate, we'll specify on the dye option on the left and it, it says um, dye or A's, if you are interested in A's, you just select A's over there and then it will give you the A's of water. But we are interested in dye, so we selected dye. And then if you have a positive number, that means it's a decay rate. If you have a negative, it will, uh, it's mean a growth rate. That's um, so how you specify your non-conservative dye. Then you run a model, and uh, when the model reaches steady state, your uh, profile would look like this. We'll import our data, and then compare, and it should, should look similar to analytical solution. And after that, we'll look into our modal calibration tools, how to specify um, the files and associate to the particular cell into the model. So here we are comparing the model results with the uh, observed or analytical solution at three different locations, RIB1, RIB2, and RIB3. Specify your path name for the files and specify what parameter you want to extract. And I'll go over these later again. Um, X and Y. So the time series form needs uh, you to provide X and Y component of your real station so that, and then it will go and find the corresponding I and J indices for that particular cell. And then it will extract the data and compare with this file that we have provided. So if you, if you screw up your parameter, let's say three to two, then it will extract temperature and not this three is what die. So you need to make sure you're providing the proper parameter here. This is first. Oh, this? No, here, if you, these are, this is the form where it says what, uh, what number represents what parameter. Yeah, in EFDC model. I mean, this is just a EE, EE thing. It's just categorized. If it is one, just it will extract temperature. If so it's. Each row just can get one parameter. Yeah, each row is one parameter and one location. Okay. So if you want to have uh, different parameters for each location, you have to have uh, different rows at this point. And what layers you want to extract is specified on the K column over here. So after that, you spe you would extract um, an EFTC model will create a time series of temp uh, dye concentration at dif three different locations. And after you save the format, uh, regardless of how many times you run, it will be the exact format and you don't have to worry about uh, linking it again. So if the grid cells are the same and the only thing you are changing is your flows or uh, your parameters. All of your calibration state, uh, locations and calibration information will be saved safely in the model so you don't have to load it again. So it saves a lot of time. Okay. So that, that's what we're going to do. Um, any questions at this point?